Histopathology. Histopathology is a vast subject. The knowledge about histopathology should start in the operation theatre where the samples are collected. Accurate patient identification, orientation of samples and adequate fixation rest in the hands of the OT staff. Appropriate grossing and sampling is in the hands of junior pathology staff who are generally entrusted this part of the process. Adequate processing, appropriate embedding techniques, microtomy, staining and avoiding unacceptable artefacts all rest with the histopathology technicians. Finally, inspection of controls to determine correctness of strains and immunohistochemical methods and most of all, reporting of the slides are all in the hands of expert pathologists. Going through the entire gamut of activities is beyond the scope of this video and so we shall dwell only on select aspects. Sample Collection Tissues are collected and fixed in 10% formalin. Formalin will slowly penetrate the tissue causing chemical and physical changes that will harden and preserve the tissue and protect it from degeneration. Few tissues require special fixatives. For example, testicular biopsies fix better in Bouin's solution. Tagging of the specimens is highly recommended for easy orientation of the tissue. Every institute should evolve tagging mechanisms of communication between surgery and pathology staff. For example, one silk suture for superior margin, two for lateral margins, etc. This should be clearly defined in the SOPs. Any orientation of the large specimens, if unclear, should be immediately communicated with the clinician and be clarified. Such communication shall also be documented by the pathologist on the request form. Large surgical resection specimens should not be sliced or opened by the surgeon, but sent directly to the laboratory. Small fragile specimens, such as bone marrow or true cut liver or kidney specimens can be wrapped in a gauze envelope so that they do not disintegrate during transport. A test requisition form for cytopathology and histopathology must have space to capture details of patient demographics, details of histories of patients, anatomic sites of biopsies, number of containers sent, specimen transportation instructions, etc. Specimen transportation. Samples may be transported at room temperature and must be labelled with a 10% formalin hazard label. All samples should be placed in a well-sealed leak-proof container. Specimen accessioning. One of the biggest challenges laboratories face is the ability to accurately label and track laboratory specimens throughout the lab process in order to avoid potential misidentification errors. Patient and specimen identification are critical elements in surgical pathology. Proper identification of specimens should be done by instructing technicians to use at least two patient identifiers when receiving samples. As there are multiple levels of tissue handling, during which errors can enter the testing process. Specimen identification must be maintained across steps like grossing, block preparation, slide labeling, etc. Laboratories can create their own customized checklists for the same. Grossing Precise and systematic gross description, dissection and selection of sections for microscopic study are crucial parts of the pathologic examination and often cannot be remedied if omitted or done poorly at the time of the initial workup. This should be done by a pathologist having reasonable skill in histopathology and should not be left to the technical staff. Bony or cartilaginous tissues are placed in the decalcifying solution for one to seven days. The tissue is washed three to four times with distilled water. Number of bits received must be noted especially in small biopsies. Representative samples of the tissues are placed in tissue cassettes using a scalpel and fine pointed forceps. Each tissue cassette 
is labelled with the identification number. Inking of samples must be integrated into the grossing system. This enables the evaluation of the margins of resection on microscopy. The practice of inking the surgical margins, sampling the tumour margins or capsule, its interface with the non-tumorous tissue must be followed. After grossing each specimen, the grossing area including all instruments shall be rinsed with copious amounts of water and wiped clean to prevent any mix-ups of floaters of tissues. It is ideal to perform grossing in well-ventilated, well-lit grossing stations. Exhaust and proper light should be switched on. Proper gloves, mask and apron should be worn every day while grossing. Grossing station should be cleaned with 1% sodium hypochlorite daily after grossing. Instruments used in grossing should be put in 1% sodium hypochlorite after use. Dedicated grossing room is mandatory. Formalin vapour monitoring must be done to detect excess harmful vapour. Monitoring of environmental conditions. Apart from temperature and humidity, formalin vapour monitoring forms are an important record in a histopathology laboratory. Formalin is volatile and toxic and causes irritation to the eyes, mucous membranes and skin and is associated with increased risk for all cancers. Occupational safety and health administration regulations specify an exposure limit of 0.75 parts per million as an 8-hour time-weighted average and 2 parts per million for short-term exposures. If formaldehyde can be detected by smell, it likely means that exposure is occurring at a concentration beyond acceptable limits. Limit exposure to formaldehyde in the following manner. Cover all specimen buckets where organs may be deposited for fixation. Periodically spray a formalin neutralizing agent on the waste as it is filled. Seal off the bag when it is filled. Discard bagged formalin-soaked towels and other waste in a lined container that can be opened and closed with a foot pedal. Cut large fixed organs in a fume hood or downdraft table. Monitor the level of formalin fumes generated in the hood and outside by a formalin fume monitoring device and the levels should be kept below 1 parts per million. Tissue processing. The concept of processing is to harden the tissue enough to enable cutting into 5 micron sections which can then be stained and examined under a microscope. Water should be removed from the tissue and progressively replaced by wax to make a tissue block a suitable for sectioning. But how can this be accomplished as water and wax cannot be mixed? We need a mechanism to first drive out the water. This is called dehydration. For this, the tissue is progressively immersed in successively higher concentrations of alcohol till the water is all driven out. The concentrations used are 50% alcohol for 90 minutes, 70% alcohol for 90 minutes, 80% alcohol for 90 minutes, 95% alcohol for 90 minutes, 100% alcohol for 90 minutes and 100% alcohol for 12 hours. Now, the water is driven out but alcohol and wax are still immiscible. So, we need a reagent that can mix both alcohol and wax and can act as a bridge between the two. This reagent is the organic solvent xylene. So, we immerse the tissue in xylene and drive out the alcohol. This step is called clearing. Multiple changes may be required to clear the ethanol. Our final destination is however wax. So, we now chase out the xylene and immerse the tissue in molten wax at 60 degrees centigrade. This is called paraffin impregnation. In a large pathology laboratory, much of this tissue processing is automated in order to save time and to produce consistent results. All what we described earlier happens in an automated way. 
This will overcome the laborious steps in processing and human errors and forgetfulness. However, the tissue processor should be maintained well. Here are a few steps to remember. Processes for start up and shut down of the processor and the details of solution change should be standardized and work desk displays should be available for the same. The lab must write its SOP on its own depending on the resources, space and requirements. Cassettes must be cleaned by keeping them in used xylene for one hour. Automatic processors can malfunction. Problems arising from this include dried specimens, burnt specimens and specimens that have remained in the clearing agent for too long. The dried out tissues or badly processed tissues are best improved by reprocessing by the formal glycerol procedure. Any malfunction in the processing shall be documented by the technician with the cognizance of the histopathologist. Such documentation shall also include the tissues affected, the recourse followed and the action taken. The need for UPS is very vital in ensuring uninterrupted processing. Since the processor is run during night hours, contingencies for breakdown should be followed in the event of a UPS malfunction. Interruption to carousal movement can result in the basket hanging above, leading to drying out and tissue damage. Similarly, prolonged immersion in xylene, isopropyl alcohol, etc. The results can be poorly and incompletely dehydrated, cleared and infiltrated specimens, which will cause further problems when sectioning, staining and examining the tissues. Although mechanical or electrical faults occasionally occur in tissue processors, processing mishaps where tissues are actually compromised mainly occur because of human error. Timing Mechanism Timer is meant to keep the tissue in different reagents and wax for an optimum time. If kept for longer or shorter period than necessary, tissue will not be adequately processed. Temperature Factory set standard working temperature is generally 65 degrees centigrade. The paraffin station heating will automatically switch on when the actual temperature of the paraffin is 5 degrees centigrade below standard working temperature. When working with paraffin that has a melting point below 58 degrees centigrade, the instrument working temperature can be readjusted with the corresponding setting screw. If you find that the paraffin does not melt completely after lowering the working temperature, slightly readjust. Resetting after excess temperature shutdown should be clearly understood as per the manufacturer's instructions. Temperature of the wax bath must be checked and recorded daily. Maintenance Use of an inappropriate processing schedule or the making of a fundamental mistake, perhaps in replenishing or sequencing of processing reagents, can result in the production of tissue specimens that cannot be sectioned and therefore will not provide any useful microscopic information. Reagent change. The reagent solutions should be changed depending upon the quality and quantity of samples processed. Symbolically, with present load of 300 to 350 cassettes per day, the solutions need to be changed as follows. Absolute alcohol in first container, alternate day, xylene, every third day, and wax weekly. However, Formalin needs to be changed every day. It shall be the responsibility of the technician in charge to maintain the correct concentration and levels of the processing solutions. A log shall be created and maintained by the technician for the days of changing the processing solutions. Clean the instrument on a daily basis. Mop any reagent spill immediately. Once a month, lift the carousal cover to its upper end position, clean the carousal axle with a cleaning cloth and subsequently apply a thin coat of equipment oil. Preventive maintenance should be done once a year by an authorized service manager. Use of copper sulphate in final alcohol. 
A layer of anhydrous copper sulfate is placed at the bottom of a dehydrating bottle or beaker and is covered with two to three filter papers of approximate size to prevent staining of the tissue. Anhydrous copper sulfate removes water from alcohol. It is white in color while the hydrated form is blue. Therefore, it acts as an indicator for the presence of water. Calibration Calibrations of the timer and the thermostat are required every year or as per lab policies. Embedding The impregnated tissue now has to undergo embedding. For embedding the tissue in melted paraffin, metallic moulds are used. At first, lubrication of the metallic moulds is done by liquid paraffin. After that, melted paraffin is poured in and the tissue is carefully embedded in proper plane at the bottom of the metallic moulds. It is important for technician to have a sound knowledge of basic histology and tissue orientation to be able to embed in the correct plane so that all layers of tissues can be visible on the slide. The melted paraffin is allowed to harden at the room temperature. After hardening, the metallic moulds are removed and the blocks are properly trimmed. Then, the blocks are kept in the ice chamber of a refrigerator for some time before cutting the sections. Trimming, sectioning and labelling Trimming is done to remove excess wax from the blocks until tissue is fully exposed. Then, boundaries are cut manually to decrease the size of the section. Before starting the sectioning, the wax blocks with embedded tissue are rubbed with ice. The microtome is used to cut tissue sections 4 to 5 micrometers thick, one tissue block at a time. The microtome is nothing more than a knife with a mechanism for advancing a paraffin block standard distances across it. The setting of the microtome indicating the tissue thickness should be checked before use. The important necessity for proper sectioning is to have a very sharp knife. If you are using non-disposable knives, sharpen the knife by the following techniques. Honing Microtome knives are sharpened against a special stone called hone. Honing refers to grinding the cutting edge of the knife on a hard abrasive surface to sharpen the knife. The knife is pushed forward diagonally from heel to toe to the other end of the horn, turned over on its back and moved across the horn until the heel is in the center with the cutting edge leading and then brought back diagonally. It is then turned across the horn to its original position. Stropping This is a process of polishing an already fairly sharp edge that may be flexible or rigid. Before use and regularly, strops must be oiled and dressed. With fine carborundum powder, the rigid type is a single leather strop stretched over a wooden frame of about 12 by 2 by 2 inches. Technique The knife is laid on the near end of the strop with the cutting edge towards the operator. Knife is held with the forefinger and the thumb. Action is the exact opposite to that of honing. After sharpening the microtome knife in knife sharpener, each block of tissue is fitted in the microtome machine. Sections are cut at 4 to 5 micron thickness. Ribbons of good sections are selected and floated and flattened on lukewarm water in a water bath. Temperature of the water bath should be maintained at 50 to 55 degrees centigrade, which is around the melting point of the wax. The flattened tissue sections are placed on clean albuminized labeled slides and dried on the slide warmer. Slide warmer temperature is kept at 70 degrees centigrade and should be checked daily. If slide warmers are not available, the slides are kept in inclined positions to drain off water and allowed to dry at room temperature. The water in the bath should be changed daily and the surface should be skimmed regularly during section cutting to avoid floaters. Labeling is an important step and must be done with great care and clearly with a diamond pencil. Note: 
It is important to have a properly fixed and embedded block or artifacts can be introduced in the sectioning. Common artifacts include tearing, ripping, Venetian blinds, holes, folding, etc. Steps of hematoxylin and eosin staining. Different labs may follow different staining procedures. Each procedure needs to be standardized as per requirement. Maintain and upgrade your SOPs periodically. Workbench aids should be used as the staining involves multiple steps. Deparaffinization. Paraffin is removed by dipping the slides in xylene. Three changes of xylene are used for five minutes each with gentle wiping of the back of the slide and around the tissue section after each change. Next step is hydration in which the slides are dipped in alcohol. First in 90% alcohol and then in 80% alcohol for two seconds each. Next, place the slides under running tap water for two minutes. This step is done for bluing and hydration of the slide. Now, stain the slide with hematoxylin stain for 15 to 20 minutes. Again, place the slide under running tap water for 5 minutes. Next, dip the slides for a few times in 1% acid alcohol for decolorization. Place the slides under running tap water for 15 minutes or till the sections turn blue. Counter stain the slide with 1% eosin stain. Again, immerse in water for 1 minute. The next step is dehydration, which is done by immersing the slides in ascending concentrations of alcohol. Dip the slide 2 to 3 times, first in 90% and then in 100% alcohol. The slides then need to be cleared in xylol. This is done thrice for 2 minutes each. Gently wipe the back of the slide and around the tissue section after each change. Now, mount the slide with DPX. Place some amount of DPX on the tissue section and place a cover slip on it. Remove air bubbles by gently pressing with the forceps. Wipe the excess DPX with a tissue. The slide is now ready to be viewed under the microscope. The nuclei of the tissue stain blue, while the cytoplasm stains shades of pink to red.